Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to this virtual visit to CMS. So um, we have the, yeah, we have the QuarkNet program. We can't quite see you guys, but I'm a big fan of the program. I've actually participated in a few talks and I think a previous virtual visit as well. So my name is Andres. Uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico and I'm a postdoc based here at CERN. I did actually spend some time at Fermilab. You may notice my t-shirt. Uh, so I spent two summers in Fermilab as an undergrad. And yeah, I work with the CMS collaboration and I will pass it on to Sonia. She can introduce herself. Hello, everybody. My name is Sonia, coming from Italy. I'm here at CERN a long, long time. Uh, I'm happy to, to, to be here today because usually I'm part of the QuarkNet uh, projects uh, in the master classes uh, uh, along the years. So I hope that you will enjoy this visit. Um, I came to Fermilab uh, many times, uh, but I didn't get uh, any <laughs> T-shirt. <laughs> And uh, okay, um, enjoy. Great, so just in terms of logistics, I'm gonna be uh, here on the surface and talk a bit about CMS while Sonia shows you the underground areas. So um, we unfortunately are not gonna be able to show you the detector. So as you, I'm sure you've seen in the news, we just restarted 13.6 uh, TV collisions, which is record energy. Um, just on Tuesday, we had the first stable beams um, at these record energies. So should we, yes, so Sonia's prepared. Should we, I think we can just go ahead and you can get ready. And meanwhile, I will, um, yeah, describe a bit the LHC and CMS. If I can just see. So uh, just to tell you that uh, I will be your eyes. So please follow me. I hope uh, that you will enjoy, as uh, usually I enjoy doing these visits. And um, okay, we cannot enter the cavern, but we will play the, with the magne uh, magnetic field, which is already something you will see. See you. Great. Okay, so I think, um, Sultan, is it okay if they interrupt for questions or, yeah, so if you guys have any questions at any point, please just go ahead and interrupt. So um, I, I know that you guys already know a bit about the LHC and about CMS, but um, just to give you a, a bit of context, let's say geographically. So this is the view from the Jura Mountains, which are actually behind us here at CMS. And this is, of course, we don't have a, a giant uh, yellow painted uh, circle around. Uh, so this just indicates where the LHC areas are underground, where the LHC tunnel is. And you can see in the far distance are the Alps. So I even today, they kind of look, there are some clouds, but you can see the, the Alps, uh, sometimes they mix together. But this is a, a view where you can only see the Alps. There's no, this is not, it's a clear day. Um, and yeah, you can see uh, the Geneva Lake a bit into the foreground. You might even be able to see the airport close to where LHCB is. And then you have Atlas and CERN, this, that's the main campus. So uh, CMS is pretty far away. We are in France. You, you might be able to tell the dotted line represents the border between France and Switzerland. Um, so CMS is near the town of Cessy, France, and it's relatively close to the Jura Mountains. It's about a 20 minute drive from the CERN, the, the main CERN campus. So I think the next slide is at like an underground Okay, so this is the, the accelerator, but very quickly, I mean, th there's much more to CERN than just the LHC. There's many, many experiments that uh, ha many have to do with particle physics, but we have also neutrino physics, we have um, heavy ion physics, we have all sorts of projects, we even things uh, that are, I'm not even sure. Yeah, so there's like fixed target experiments. Some of them have to do with uh, atmospheric physics, for example, so yeah. There's, I also always like to point out that you might be able to see the dates in some of the facilities here. So some of these date back to the very early 60s. So the PS, for example, was the most powerful accelerator of its time, the proton synchrotron. And then uh, it's still operational today. But in the 70s, they built a bigger one and they were very creative with the name and they just added a super in front of it. 
and that's the SPS, the super proton synchrotron. Uh, but again, it was the, the most powerful proton antiproton collider of its time. You can say it was a uh, predecessor to the Tevatron actually. And yeah, we discovered the vector bosons there and a uh, few Nobel prizes were awarded for that. So the next slide um, is about, I, I mentioned things are underground. And one thing that this picture doesn't show you is the fact that things are not quite level. They're not horizontal to the ground. The LHC tunnel is actually slanted. Uh, so it's deeper towards the Jura mountains and it's uh, shallower towards the lake, let's say. And the there's a, the reason I you know the main reason why it's this way it's because that's where the bedrock is they call it over here the molasses and an interesting reason I, I don't know if you noticed in the first picture we showed you most of the LHC tunnel infrastructure is in France and Sultan might correct me if I'm wrong but I think one of the main reasons is that in France if you buy property if you buy land you only own down to 50 meters uh, of land. It, oh, that's Switzerland as well. I thought it was only France. So, I, mm -hmm. so in the US, it's different. So that's that's why you, for me, that I had to buy the land or obtain, acquire the land. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, here I thought it, Switzerland didn't have this law. That's why it was mostly in France. But okay. Um, but yeah, this is another reason why we can build underground and we didn't have to buy the, all the property uh, on the surface. Okay, so I think um, there's many more things to say about the LHC, but I think we can sort of move on to the experiments and I can come back and uh, give you more information if you're interested. But at the LHC, we have four big experiments. We have Atlas CMS, and these are sort of um, general purpose detectors. That means that we do research that is very general and very similar research. Uh, you may have, you, you probably know, for example, that both Atlas and CMS simultaneously uh, announce the discovery of the Higgs. And that's very much um, necessary, right? For, for us to be able to say that we have discovered a new particle, we, we need to be able to say that we have independently, we have independent evidence for, for that new particle. Uh, and we have ELISE, uh, which is a more specialized detector, and it's a, it focuses on heavy ion collisions. And then we have LHCP, which is a very interesting detector. It's, it's asymmetric. It doesn't really look like the others. And um, it focuses on very specific kind of particle physics that have to do with uh, symmetry and it have to do with uh, flavor physics, for example. Uh, so I think we can... I think that's a, a sort of a general introduction to the experiments. Maybe we can look at the next slide. Sure. Andres? Yes. Sorry, Sonia, I can't see uh, you, but if you yeah, want to no, go ahead. Okay, now we yeah, can yeah, see you. No, was yeah, yeah, was, was just to, to make a test. And maybe, you know, I saw that you were showing the picture on the screen. I have, I have a model here. I don't know if it's visible. Yeah, we okay, can see. This is, uh, yeah, okay, maybe, okay, we can see a little bit of how the detector, this is the center of the detector. This is the beam pipe. And then, okay, then Andres, uh, he will explain uh, more in details as I'm going down. He will explain now, you see, you have the light. This is uh, the beam pipe of LHC. It's going uh, as a stick inside the, this, uh, cylinder, which is the CMS detector. And then as I was saying, you see many layers from the center to the, to the edge. And uh, Andres, he will uh, describe uh, uh, as I go underground uh, this detector. But basically you have a, a, a part for the trajectories. And then you have a part for the energy of the particles. And then uh, this part here, which is uh, Okay, if you do the cross section is a ring, but basically it's a cylinder, empty cylinder is the, the magnet in the center. And then here you have iron and the muon chambers. So this is a model we have here is very small, but the real size of this object is 25 meters long. And the diameter is 15 meters long, which gives a building of eight floors in length and the building of five floors in high. 
Now, uh, Sonia, I move, can I yes. can I very quickly before you move on, can I ask you? I think the lights yeah. work, and maybe I could ask you to light up the magnet. I think that would I be. I can try. I can try. So the LHC beam is this one. I don't know if you can see. Can you see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So this is uh, basically is the beam coming from this side. The other part is not open, so you have a uh, basically two beams. Can you no no? Can you take this? Yeah, so you had the two beams uh, coming in this uh, sense and uh, crossing uh, in the center on this line, okay? And then uh, you have the magnet. I don't know if you can see, I can try to highlight the magnet. Uh, so you yeah. see, That's as great. I Thanks. said, uh, is, uh, yeah, is a cylinder, empty cylinder. If you do the cross section, it will be a ring. Uh, and uh, this is also behind the, uh, the picture behind uh, Andres. And then we have the pixel. I don't think we can see it, but maybe we can see. We can see this part that you see. I light. This is part of the of the tracking system. Is silicon system. We have many. I I can try to switch all them. Yes, this is the cross section. <laughs> is the okay. picture of uh, the detector. And then, okay, I don't know if you can uh, switch back uh, to show the other things uh, that maybe I can, uh, I don't know if you can right. see this. So this is the okay. electromagnetic calorimeter and maybe exactly. just, just yeah. for, I don't know, the, I can perhaps so, uh, show if you can see the laser light. It's this sort of golden ring around here. Even though it looks like the dead center, the tracker is really at the dead center over here. And then this golden ring, that's actually the electromagnetic electromagnetic. Yes, power. the one you are showing uh, is this one, basically. Maybe people, they can see the, the light in the center. And then uh, the electromagnetic calorimeter is this one. And then we have the hadronic calorimeter, which is this one, which is uh, in the blue part you see in the picture, but the, uh, the, the edge of this blue part, the external edge of this picture, and then you have the immune system, which is all this part. I hope you can see. Yeah. Then, okay, you will describe much better as I'm going down. I wanted to show people um, how I'm entering uh, the, the experimental site. So you see this door here. Now I have to badge. I leave, uh, I go in front of the camera. So you see me. I will badge with my dosimeter to be recognized. And uh, I will, uh, I have to pass uh, three kinds of tests. One is a weight test because this is uh, a, a door for people, it's not for material. And then we have a, a infrared beams uh, just checking that we are not introducing uh, uh, material through this door. And uh, the last one is a biometric check, uh, which recognized me as uh, the person I am, because uh, my, my iris uh, is in the CERN database. So I will do now this, uh, you will see how, how I am. Yeah, so very often Sultan likes to point out that these are newer uh, retina scanners, if you will, and they even check for blood flow in your eye. So you have to also be alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. After Angels and Demons uh, movie. <laughs> and also this time, if I'm not wrong, it was that the check was only on one iris and now is on two. So, which would be even worse. Now, as you see, I'm entering the. I'm just entering this zone. Uh, we have here the elevator. Now, I just call the elevator, and on the opposite side, in front of the elevator, I have this blue door. You see, there is the. There are the green doors there, and there is. A, there are two doors, as the one I. I passed on the other side, but there is also this blue door. This is for material. 
And uh, okay, I should say that if you will uh, succeed to come here to visit us, that we hope you will uh, you will do as soon as possible. Uh, as uh, your iris, uh, you cannot pass uh, the biometric check. We the only way to enter this place is uh, to go through the material doors. The only thing we can do is that instead of leaving you in the middle, because there are two doors, instead of leaving you in the middle of the two doors, we can just uh, badge and then we open the two doors at the same time so, so you can enter you will uh, receive a nice uh, uh, orange helmet as uh, which is in this box as noemi has shown and then you come in this is the elevator now as i go uh, in i will give the lie the floor to to undress because uh, the the network should be lost and uh, okay I will wait for you underground as the, 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 the network will come back. Bye. Okay, thank you, Sonia. Okay, so as Sonia makes her journey 87 meters underground, um, we maybe can talk a bit more about the detector. So you saw some of the components, but maybe I can add a, a, a bit of detail. So I think the main thing that I wanted to point out, I, I actually like to first describe CMS starting from the magnet. So we talked about this magnet and most of our detector in a way, right, in a non, uh, not very accurate way, most of our detector is inside it's of the magnet. So the magnet is six meters in inner diameter. And when we cool it down to cryogenic temperatures and we pump 18,000 amperes of current, we can generate almost four Tesla, which is something like 200,000 times uh, greater than the Earth's magnetic field. Um, but when I say that most of the detectors within the magnet volume, that's, that means that the tracking and the calorimetry are inside of the magnet. And by tracking, it means we, we try to re uh, reconstruct the trajectory of charged particles. So a charged particle will leave uh, hits or um, signals in, silicon, in the silicon detectors in the tracker. And because of the magnetic field, these charged particles will curve. As you may, may imagine, uh, a particle that's heavier or it's traveling faster is not gonna bend as much, right? So this bending of the particles will help us determine their momentum. And after the tracking, the tracking again is very non-invasive. We wanna just observe the particles. So we don't wanna influence or affect their trajectories. But then we have the calorimetry, which is still, again, within the magnet's uh, volume. And the calorimeters are very different. We really want to absorb the particles. We want to just uh, completely absorb the energy of these particles and transform that into light using scintillators. So we have two different types of calorimeters. You can see this electromagnetic calorimeter in green and then hadronic calorimeter in yellow. And uh, predominantly, the, the electromagnetic calorimeter um, basically absorbs um, or, or we get hits from electromagnetic showers, let's say these are mainly electrons and photons. And the hadronic calorimeter is mostly uh, QCD or, and these are basically just charged or neutral hadrons. And these are composite particles that are basically quarks and gluons, let's say. So after that, when you move outside of the magnet, you have the uh, the muons are basically the only particles that punch Andres? through. Andres? Yes. Yeah. Just Can one you second, hear me Sonia. now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Just no, no, second. I wanted to leave you to continue for the for the muons, uh, just to say where I am and the moment I move, uh, you can continue if it's uh, okay for you. So I can profit sure. that uh, your explanation of when I'm moving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and maybe coming back, I can show you other uh, other things. Uh, just to say that I'm now at minus 90. Um, as uh, you see now, uh, uh, Noemi, she's showing uh, the, the actual uh, uh, deepness. Uh, we have three levels here is uh, the minus uh, the minus one, we call the minus one floor, which is minus 80 meters, then the minus two floor, which is minus 90 and the, the minus three, which is minus 100, more or less. Uh, this is a safety zone, which is in front of the elevator. I have just in front of me, because here the air is uh, pumped outside, so nothing can enter. What I mean that if in the experimental zone uh, outside that I will uh, enter in a few moments, uh, um, 
there is, for example, uh, a fire, so smoke, for example, or a gas leakage, nothing can enter here because we pump air the air outside. And so this is a safety zone, which means also that the evacuation, in case we should evacuate, must be done using the elevator. It's totally different as the usual daily life. This is maybe one of the few things different from the daily life. We have stairs, we cannot use stairs, only if we are escorted by the fire brigades. Um, now, I will enter here, you will see some uh, uh, images, but uh, I think that I will go immediately to show you the effect of the magnetic field, and then coming back uh, as uh, you will go, uh, you have got uh, more information about the detector as Andres is doing. I will uh, maybe stop in the counting room and also show you other things. Okay, thank you, Andres. Okay, so I just wanted to add a, a very quick remark about the muon system. So uh, I was saying that the particles, the particles that punch through the magnets are muons, and these are just heavier electrons. Uh, there's another particle that of course punches through, which are neutrinos, but we don't really detect neutrinos, only indirectly. If people are curious, we can talk about how we do that. But muons are the ones that punch through. And actually there's a lot of iron in the muon system uh, when i say a lot of iron I'm, i mean 12,500 tons of it the total weight of the detector is 14,000 tons which is about twice the weight of the eiffel tower um, but the reason there's so much so much steel in the muon system is that it's actually part of the return yoke that means that uh, we still produce about two tesla outside of the solenoid so it's four, roughly four Tesla inside and then two Tesla outside. And that really helps us to, uh, well, bend the trajectory of muons and determine their momentum. Um, so Sonia, we can, I think, come back to you. <laughs> okay, yes, okay. I'm uh, close to the last point I can reach. So first of all, I think, I, I, I have you shown already the map uh of the site here or not we have a maybe slide we can... yeah but because maybe... we have a map here but if you have the slide maybe you can project this otherwise i can use this one so we're okay, showing yes it now. yes now okay you see this position now uh you should uh, rotate 90 degrees <laughs> Uh, to the right, the picture, because the, the 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 cavern I have here, I was coming from uh, these stairs and I reached this uh, uh, red door. Now this is uh, part is the last really the the, the last corner of the um, ex, um, service cavern. The service cavern uh, is where you put all the the things needed for the detector. Okay, can be electronics, uh, can be uh, tanks of gas, uh, power supplies, uh, all the all the things you really need to make your detector working uh, properly. And then there is a corridor here, and uh, on the other side of this uh, wall, we have another parallel cavern, as you can see from uh, the map, which is called uh, the experimental cavern, where the detector is. So basically, you have two parallel caverns, so one which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, tighter and longer, and the other one which is larger and shorter. Uh, why is important this uh, red door? Uh, maybe I don't know if it can be indicated on the screen with the mouse. Uh, there is a corridor after this door, which brings you directly to the LHC tunnel. But this door is not here for this reason. Uh, we are not using neither people from CMS or nor people working in LHC. They are using this door to access the LHC. So why this is here? Um, this is a second escape path. So in case uh, we cannot go back uh, through the path I, 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 I followed before coming here, we are allowed to use this door. And why? Because uh, through this corridor, at a certain point, uh, there is uh, another elevator and uh, we, can, uh, we can evacuate using an elevator. As I told you before, 
uh, the, the door is sealed. So this is, uh, can be used only in this case. Uh, this is also the reason why we can be here because if you try to go to visit in this moment when LHC, LHC is working uh, uh, the other sites, which means uh, Atlas, uh, LHCB and the Alice, uh, you cannot go underground. Why? Because this second elevator is uh, belongs to the service cavern, while in the other detectors, uh, um, you had to go through the experimental cavern. And this means that in case of an evacuation, you, you should go through the experimental cavern. There is a certain uh, radioactive background that we know it's a really low, but for visitors, this is not allowed. So CERN decided not to allow visitors underground when LHC is working, but CMS. So this is a special thing called CMS. Um, now, I think, uh, uh, if Andres uh, agree, I would like to enjoy a little bit of the, the, the magnetic field. So I start with a detector. And please, uh, to the audience, uh, do not laugh. Huh? Okay? So this is my detector. Can you see it? <laughs> I told you, please do not laugh. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> So this is a detector and okay, I, I, I feel now as a wizard that this is not magnetized. Do you see? These are clips, they are not magnetized. But okay, mm -hmm. please uh, uh, now um, forget all the equations and uh, just enjoy physics uh, as it is, mm -hmm. which is uh, just uh, many phenomena you can observe and then we mm -hmm. rationalize using mathematics. So let's enjoy the physics with this chain. So you see this point, I ask you to, to look this point in particular, and we approach the experimental cavern. And uh, I hope you will be able to see a certain point, uh, some uh, oh, detection yeah. Yeah, of yeah. the magnetic field. You see this? Yeah. yeah. Can you see it? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, let's go, let's go. This is nothing, let's go. You see, you see it? Oh. Yeah, you see? Look, 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 yes. look here. Yes. Look, you see? Yes. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I'm a particle physicist, but I enjoy this. <laughs> I'm forgetting the all the questions. So come on, look here, look here. Look, oh. you see? Oh. <laughs> look this here. Is only 10 millitesla. Yes, more or less. Yes, exactly. And we have the detector more or less uh, from this the, uh, region at about, I guess, uh, 30 meters from this corner. You see? So uh, yeah, yeah. now, yeah, okay, this is uh, just something. Let's try something else. Let's go. Can you see this wall? This wall is not magnetized, but these screws, they are. So once I, now what I'm telling you is just uh, my experience in the sense that, okay, um, I did, the, <laughs> I was victim, uh, I did some mess and uh, something mm -hmm. happened and I was enjoyed the, what happened. So the first time was to show this uh, to visitors, uh, which is already nice, I guess. You see, it's a pendulum. <laughs> Okay, with the chains, <laughs> but at a certain point, you see the screws, they are magnetized. I don't know how it happened. These uh, other clips came here. This was just by chance, you know? And when I saw this, uh, instead of saying, oh, I did a mess, I said, okay, with this, I can play. And this is my personal magnetic swing, you know? Look, <laughs> it's, really, it's really a spring. And now, okay, I know uh, here, uh, now you have to believe me. Uh, I can tell you that uh, with my hand, I can feel uh, the, the, the chain pushing me back. Uh, I know that, okay, you have just this, uh, you have to believe me, <laughs> you cannot feel it. But uh, believe me, this is really, so you see, and this, you do not need an equation. Then of course, there is an equation be behind the differential equation for this, of course, but however, you see, it's really nice. Uh, coming here, 
I picked these two screws. So this is a, a new entry. Let's see what happens. I don't know, maybe here. Let's see. None of them are magnetized. We lost Noemi. <laughs> but I have, I, have, I have something I will show you, okay? You see, I, have, I brought many things here. So I open here and uh, let's see. I have this. Uh, now, um, maybe Zoltan or Andres, you know exactly because this I was, I, I went to the workshop, the mechanical workshop, and they throw things, and I did this kind of stuff. You know, I'm an experimentalist. This is in my <laughs> DNA. Uh, now, I don't know exactly what kind of material it is. Uh, it seems to be copper, this, but shouldn't be. And this, I don't know, it's not, it's not aluminum for sure because it's too rigid. However, let's see what happens. Now, this one, uh, at the very beginning, I thought it was the, the, magnet, uh, the, the magnetic material while I cannot really attach this, while I can do with this. You see? Oh. I hope that my audience is so happy as the picture. Yes. <laughs> yes, come on. Okay, thank you. I leave you there and I show you another thing. Now tell me what is this? Okay. Uh, you see how many things we can do with the magnetic field? <laughs> Look, this is my mobile phone. I hope it's enough clean, otherwise, uh, this will not work. But look here. What is this? A compass, yes, exactly. Can you see the, ma the, 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 the magnetic field lines? And then, okay, you see, of course, we don't have, we don't have the, the polarity here, the poles. So I can uh, turn 180 degrees, but if I try to put 90 degrees, so you see, I cannot do it. You see, <laughs> yeah, which yeah. is really nice, okay? And then the last thing, and then I will leave the floor to, okay, I will describe a little bit, but then I will leave the floor to, to, to undress anymore. Is this, once I, I was looking for my chain, and at a certain point, I had all these clips that now it seems to be a chain, but they are just monetized, and they fell completely on the floor. Now here we have some uh, metallic, uh, uh, surface, while here is, uh, is concrete, but the, you will see what happens. Look, look, look here. Can you see them? Can you see them? Can you see them? Look, and uh, it happened also this, look. Okay, which is quite nice. It's really quite nice. Okay, I'm not finished. Let's stop them, let's stop them. Okay. <laughs> okay, you, you have to, to enjoy what you have uh, around you. This is nature. So if I try to do, you know, some wind, okay, I cannot move too much. But look what happens here. Oh, I'm not wow. touching that. Eh? You see? So this is uh, the magnetic field. Can you see? And uh, yes, um, yes. Yeah, you see, it's really nice. And uh, it happened one day that as I've shown this uh, to some students and they did this. This is not uh, from me. This is from them, but I sell to you. Okay, I cannot do all the, all the stuff. Eh? Okay, I will do just a few things. They did this. Okay, they did a quarter <coughs> of this circle and they started to do this. You see? <laughs> and uh, if you do longer, it, it seems uh, that you are playing a piano, you know? Really, yeah. you see? Look, it's really nice. Okay? <laughs> this can get me crazy. I know. Then uh, if you want to rationalize, uh, there are equations. But this is physics before. So if I should convince you that physics uh, is... Uh, funny and uh, it's really nice uh, and interesting uh, i think this was the best thing to do now before i i, I take this uh, back and i just describe you the door the yellow door and then i give the floor to 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 undress any, uh, again if uh, if uh, lhc would have been not working 
we would have been able to access this door, which is uh, another door with the same checks uh, we saw um, we saw before, uh, but it's yellow because it's another kind of alert in case you want to enter, you are not allowed. Um, and then after there is a corridor, 10 meters, uh, you enter the experimental cavern on the other side. What you would see, there is a green, a green door as this one I have here, but uh, double. And uh, you see in front of you this object, which is the detector. Uh, this is closed, this CMS. And from here, uh, you have one of the beam pipe of LHC. Okay. Um, Andres, I think that for the time being, I can leave you the floor uh, so you can continue. I Great. take back all my stuff. Okay. And then, okay, I, maybe I can uh, continue in the, in the counting room as so, you want. Okay. Sonia. Yeah, so yeah. A, a quick remark before you, you move. So this door uh, directly behind you is, uh, I don't think we mentioned that the door where the poster is, this door that separates the detector. This one? Uh, sorry, the, the wall, I, I, sorry. I meant the wall ah, yes. behind you. So this wall yeah. is uh, actually called the pilier, and this is actually a seven meter steel reinforced wall that separates the detector from the service cavern where Sonia is. So it's remarkable that where Sonia is, the uh, as Sultan mentioned, this is roughly something like 10 million pairs, which is still, sorry, Tesla, sorry, <laughs> sorry, 10 milli Tesla. Um, so that's, you can imagine the magnitude of the magnetic field inside of the detector volume. Uh, so at, at the other side of this wall, once you get very close to the detector, it is very, very striking just to strengthen the, ma the magnetic field. Uh, Andres, Andres. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, maybe as you were talking about the magnetic field that we feel here, this is a, the fringe magnetic field, but maybe uh, our audience, uh, they can have a look to the previous uh, uh, virtual visit we did uh, where we, when we were able to enter the cavern with the magnetic field, uh, and okay, is another experience, okay? You know, the famous uh, chain I was talking here, you see now the bend, the, the, the chain, you see how, how is bent like that, okay? This is uh, nothing. If you enter, you have something, something like that, mm -hmm. okay? Oh, wow. And uh, when, you walk, uh, when you walk on the floor, I can tell you because I have this kind of, everybody who enters here has this special floor uh, shoes, they have some iron on the top to protect your feet. So it seems that you are really uh, floating, I don't know, on the, on the snow or on, uh, on the air. It's really, it's really funny. For me, it's funny, okay? It's an experience. But it's, as Andres said, it's really uh, much different. And maybe he can explain why we get only a, a very low magnetic field outside. Even if inside we have almost, we have a 3.8 Tesla. Do you want to say this, Andres? So I take this uh, back. Sure. So this is related to what we were talking about. So the muon system, as I mentioned, has a lot of steel. So I mentioned it's something like uh, 12,500 tons of steel. And you can actually see anytime you see red in our detector, that is steel. Uh, so that is what actually allows us to, to produce about two Tesla of magnetic field, but it's only within that steel volume, which is where the muon system um, uh, is actually inside of. There's many muon, muon systems. We haven't really talked about them. Um, so, but that's, that's the main reason. So outside of this uh, steel volume, the magnetic field dies off pretty quickly. Okay, so there's a couple of um, other things that I would like to mention, but Sonia, anything else from your side? Okay, so um, so before we, we actually started the, the visit proper, I, I overheard a bit of discussion and uh, yeah, uh, a few, details that I heard from the room. So I'd, I'd like to mention just a few more facts um, or a few more details, let's say. So when before we started, we uh, sort of described 
part of how the LHC works, right? So the LHC, you can see this blue dipole here. So the LHC has 1,232 of these dipoles. They're each about $10 million or so. So they're not cheap. And uh, this is what allows us to, I mean, this is the limiting factor for the energy. So the fact that we are running at 13.6 TeV rather than 13 TeV, as we did a couple of years ago, that is due to improvement, improvements in the magnets. Sonia, you're, you're muted, but I think you're trying to say something. Do you see? It seems I'm inside the LHC. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm cheating. <laughs> this is a nice picture, you see? Maybe Noemi sh can show me. <laughs> you see, I'm just outside. But these visitors, they love to stay here and to do pictures like that, you know, or just detaching <laughs> the label or putting something like that. Okay, this is what we can offer for the LHC here. <laughs> so as I have to come back because I see the time. So uh, just uh, uh, follow me. In the meanwhile, uh, 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 Andres is talking and uh, I just thought that you saw many other uh, panels and labels, uh, radiation, etc. Maybe uh, we can talk about this if we have time later. I just wanted to show you something and then I come back uh, on surface. Is this wall, which is uh, in, the, in the county room. Uh, I leave, I leave Andres then to describe the trigger because here it's uh, really noisy. But this uh, wall, which is uh, just made of cables uh, because here we have cables, optical fibers, uh, but uh, this is, uh, as a, in my opinion, this is my personal view as a metaphoric meaning. Uh, can you see, maybe we can show a little bit better. I can, uh, okay, I can come here. You see these cables. Now, okay, this is, uh, these are uh, simply, uh, um, how to say, uh, they are powering the system, uh, one of the systems, uh, but you see the, the complexity, but the regularity, the meticulosity and the precision, each cable has a label and uh, each cable has a proper length because you have to follow the normal bending of the cable. So why it's metaphorical for me, this is a part of the ca a character of a physicist. So as you saw, uh, you understood that I hope uh, that we like to enjoy um, any aspect uh, of nature and nature is physics and the life in general. But when we are to work, we are very focused. We try to be very precise. And this is, uh, if you want uh, uh, a transposition of this way of working. If we work, we work seriously, seriously precise, uh, Focus the with patience, and then we enjoy when we are to enjoy, as you saw, close to the LHC. Uh, Andres, I leave you the floor to talk about the trigger and all the rest, and I come up because I think it's already the time. Is it okay, okay for you? Yes, thanks, Sonia. Quick. So maybe to add a bit more context, so those red cables that we were just okay. looking at are part of the RPC system. Those are resistive plate chambers. And that's one of the muon systems that we have in the detector. It's a very fast detector and each of those cables providing thousands of volts. So we have to provide quite a significant amount of voltage to bias the chambers. So around here, you can see many other racks. There's many systems and uh, this could be, you can see a lot of fiber optics. These could be uh, low voltage, high voltage. This could be infrastructures such as PLCs that are regulating or and or monitoring the either the humidity, the temperature of the detector, the conditions in the detector, and so on. So there's many, many systems. Uh, these in particular, these are PLCs, and the, the orange stripes indicate that these are uninterruptible. Uh, they're un, in, uh, under uninterruptible power, let's say. So... Uh, yes, many, many systems. <laughs> We're showing you parts of the, uh, <laughs> of the visit that you would not normally be able to see here. So these, uh, I think most of these fibers, most of these systems correspond to the DAQ system. Uh, very often, uh, and these are for trackers, so very often we have fiber optics that can, are, are receiving signals from the detector and they go into these boards. These, uh, inside of these boards, there are FPGAs. These are essentially uh, programmable uh, 
chips, let's say. And I think it's worth emphasizing that the firmware for each of these things has to be, you know, most of what you see in this service cavern has to be designed uh, and developed, tested by physicists. So there's a lot of custom firmware, a lot of custom hardware that's developed by institutions and universities around the world. So I wanted to mention a bit more about the trigger since it sounded like you guys were a bit curious about Andres, it. Andres, yep. sorry, <laughs> accept my apologies. <laughs> I interrupt you for the last time. I wanted to show the minus 100. <laughs> Otherwise I will live here. I don't know if you can see through this uh, uh, um, grid, you can see the floor with the, some uh, yellow strips. This is the minus 100. Okay, so we cannot access uh, this, uh, this level, which is the basement, is not the lowest part of the detector because, uh, okay, the, the detector is at this level, but below we have other electronics, uh, but at least you can see it. Consider that usually during uh, the data taking, uh, we have here, a, a, I call it a floor, which is this uh, panel, which goes down, so everything is closed. Uh, we cannot really see. Now we at least we can see the minus 100. Uh, Why this? I don't know if Noemi. She, usually she is very good in showing this. Uh, you can see the ceiling uh, of this uh, from this uh, shaft. I don't know if you can uh, manage to see a, a rectangle, a light rectangle. Uh, at the at the end of this uh, shaft, which is uh, from where I was coming before, uh, and you see also the lights uh, of the stairs. These should prove that I'm really at minus uh, ninety meters, <laughs> at least. Okay, uh, so I think I will come back, and uh, maybe we I can show something uh, from the control room. Okay, thank you, Andres. So maybe this is a good time to ask if there are questions. Um, please go ahead if you have any. How does that magnetic field affect um, her body when she's down there? So uh, the answer is that it does not, um, especially not the magnetic field that she was just exposed to. So that 10 uh, milli Tesla is not that much. Uh, and furthermore, as uh, Sonia was saying, we have had a chance, uh, many of us actually have had the chance to go inside of the detector and experience, uh, well, much, 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 much stronger magnetic fields. But even if you were somehow, you found yourself within the uh, solenoid volume, which generates something like four Tesla, that's actually not that much compared to other systems. So the CMS solenoid is, the largest continuous supercondu or the most powerful continuous magnetic system, as far as I know, in the world. So it's six meters in inner diameter and it can generate uh, four Tesla. But if you take an MRI or take an imaging scan of some sort, you might be exposed to something like twice that amount in a roughly, very roughly speaking, um, and it's not dangerous. I mean, it's only dangerous if you have some sort of medical implant. Uh, you can look around the literature and there may be some effects, but nothing significant, let's say. Yes. How much electrical Andres. current runs through the solenoid? How much current runs okay. through the solenoid? Uh, so to generate 3.8 Tesla, we have to run 18,000 amperes. Holy cow. Yes. To be precise. <laughs> Now that you're in the third run, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Sultum was saying 18,640 amperes to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> With this third run that you're doing, is it the same energy as the last time or is it more energy, higher it's, energy? It's slightly more energy. So during run through, we were running at 13 TV and now we're up to 13.6 TV. You may recall that the, the sign energy of the LHC is 14 TV, but this is entirely dependent on the 12,000, sorry, the 1,232 dipole magnets. So how much current you can uh, run through those magnets directly affects how much energy you can uh, 
you can have in the accelerator. And keep in mind that the, the worst performing magnet is going to limit your energy. So at, the, at this point, we are at 13.6. And we will see uh, how, if, if and how we can improve this in the future. But keep in mind that it's, you know, it's great that we can improve the energy, but the effects are not dramatic necessarily. So a change from 13 to 13.6 TV might not really impact, let's say, the cross section. So it, in terms of physics results, it's great, but it, it's, the impact is not uh, super dramatic, let's say. Um, article is uh, particle drops energy also in magnet, but magnet is not not detector. So how to measure the energy deposit in magnet? We don't. So the a particle, sure enough, will deposit energy into the magnet, but there's no active detector com components or any active detectors within the magnet volume. There is a HB outer. Uh, so there's such a thing as like a part of the detector that's outside the magnet, but that's not very important. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, um, most particles are absorbed by the time they reach the magnet. The exception is the muon, and the muon will not really, um, uh, let's say, deposit much energy in the magnet itself. In fact, it, it just basically just flows through, it, it just punches through, and it leaves ionization in the muon chambers and some signals, some hits in the tracking system. That's... Uh, Andres? Yes, Andres? Sonia? Uh, so uh, we are in the control room now, and uh, kindly the shift leader can tell us something about the status of LHC and the CMS, please. <laughs> So, Sonia, can you get close to her because she doesn't have a microphone? So yes. We'll... Okay. Yes. Uh, well, right now we are uh, uh, executing a test, a special test to be ready for tonight. But for tonight, tonight we should be uh, having, at least she should have again the uh, uh, the beam in the machine, and uh, we need to be ready to take data again later on. So we will perform this test, finish it in an hour or so, and we will start uh, uh, preparing the detector to be ready for the data taking later. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you in, very much. So, in particular, we expect to have the first fill with stable beams at 13.6 TV with 300 colliding bunches. And I can get into more detail about what that means in a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. we leave down the floor so we can see, okay, she is the captain of the, of the crew here. <laughs> and here we have all these specialists dealing with each part of the DRQ and on the other side of the detectors. So they are, you see, all the happy people, please smile to our <laughs> audience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just telling that we are all happy. <laughs> so, and you see here, uh, there is the status of the beam. <laughs> now we have no beam, uh, but however, you can see some uh, uh, specific values for each detector, Atlas, Alice, CMS, and LHCB concerning uh, the crossing angle and many other parameters that usually are shown when uh, the beam is on. And then there are many other technical things now. I don't want to disturb too much the, the, the working uh, planning here. Uh, there is this other part. You see, there are basically two rooms. One is this one. And then we have another one on the other side that you can see here, which is uh, devoted to the subdetectors, for example, the ECAL, uh, Andres was talking, is this post, okay? With many computers, so when you have to do your shift, you come here and uh, you pay attention that if there is an alarm, you have to solve the problem. If you are able to solve it, otherwise uh, there is always uh, the on-call expert uh, which can instruct you or can come here Oh, now, okay, we know, can connect from home and do something in case we need. So on the uh, other side of the room, yeah. actually, you see some colleagues from the pixel detector, including actually my uh, PhD advisor. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, where? <laughs> so if you if you ask Will to say hi, say hi, Will, and he'll wave back at you. Uh, hi, Will. Hi, Will. Hi, Will. Hi, Will. Tell him Andres says hi. <laughs> Andres is calling uh, <laughs> to sailor. <laughs> Andres, I'm sorry, but I was much more interested in this, you know. <laughs> By the way, they're Can empty. You they're, not, they're not full. You know, for us, for us, uh, any moment uh, is nice, uh, is uh, good uh, to toss, you know. And these uh, are uh, this is uh, just a small collection of bottles, as you can see. You had the cremant, we had the champagne, and. Uh, <laughs> The, I would say that the CMS community is real. Ah, yes, this is really nice. Then we are a little bit boring, but okay, you see. <laughs> this is our. <laughs> At least it's CMS and not Atlas here. <laughs> well, I'll just briefly mention that the volume, yes, the amount of empty yeah. champagne bottles and in the CERN control room is much larger. Ah, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. And then you see, we have a set of coffee machines. So this is not the detector, but however, this helps when you have the night shift to come here to get your coffee or the and your food, yes. And then, okay, we go out, we come back, we go from outside, we come back to you, Andres, but going from outside, so I can remove my mask and I leave you to continue. Okay, thanks, Sonia. Okay, so there's a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. I do still want to come back to the trigger, but maybe Sultan, we can show really quickly just where we are right now. We didn't really mention this, but where we are right now is we are on top of the main uh, axis shaft. So below, so right now we're I'm standing on this uh, oh large concrete slab, but we can actually move this thing out of the way. And then we have a shaft that's 100 meters. The, the detector is directly below our feet, our feet uh, 97 meters to be precise. And one thing I wanted to mention is that you can kind of see the railing here on the sides. And then you see, of course, the one-to-one -one representation of the detector. And you might notice that it is pretty tight. And what I mean by that is that when, we, when this shaft was constructed, it was very expensive. There was running water that they had to freeze. They had to freeze the soil to be able to dig through it. It was very expensive. So they only made the shaft uh, as small as possible, but still able to fit the detector. And the detector, I think that the most lightweight slice, we didn't even mention that our detector is um, actually cut into a, like a dozen slices or so. The most lightweight was something like 300 tons. The most, the heaviest was 2000 tons. So it was very difficult to lower each of the slices or very time consuming and stressful because the gap or the tolerance uh, on each side was something like five centimeters and you have to dangle this thing, lower it down a hundred meters. And you can imagine that it uh, yeah, swings a little bit. So it had to be done very, very carefully. Andres? Yes, Sonia? Can you hear me? Can I can you. see you. I can see Hi. you too. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, I wanted to show you a few things and then I enter and I remove all of the stuff. First, the Jura Mountains. Okay, this is an historical place. You, you were talking about the, the river, trees, etc. Uh, you didn't mention that here when they were digging, they found the Roman villa. Okay, before starting uh, to, to, to dig. And so they had to, I don't know, to remove things. Uh, and uh, because, okay, the Jura Mountains, they are uh, inside the very famous book of Julius Caesar, the Bello Gallico. So this is an historical place. And then you see other stuff from the LHC. Maybe this is interesting to show some elements of the LHC. These are the blue long uh, tube you see and the one before, which is without the external uh, part, is a dipole. So this is one of the 1,232 uh, 1, elements we have in the LHC uh, to bend the, magnet, uh, the, the beam because of the Lorentz force. <laughs> and uh, then you can see also uh, some a white, uh, tube which is uh, now the length of the blue tubes uh, is about uh, 13 50 meters while uh, the white one is uh, is the half of this length and they are the quadruples they are uh, 
uh, the job of these elements is uh, to focus the beam, to squeeze the beam in such a way that the, the, the cross section becomes smaller. And so this increases the probability of the, uh, the number of collision, uh, uh, collisions uh, Andres was talking about before. And then, okay, we don't have other elements. I think we have inside the radio frequency cavities. Um, maybe if we have time, we'll, uh, we'll tell about this. Uh, you see, it's a sunny day. And uh, this part maybe remind me a little bit without the Jura Mountains, uh, the one uh, Noemi is showing uh, a little bit the environments of a uh, Fermilab. <laughs> Apart that we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, all kinds of animals. So you have there because it's a natural park, here is not. We have the road just before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sonia. So um, maybe let, let me get back and if we have a minute, talk a little bit about the trigger at least because <laughs> we've mentioned it a few times. So at the LHC, when we say we collide protons, of course, it's not just one proton trying to hit another. We have bunches of protons, right? And in the LHC, we have 3,564 positions where we could have protons or not. We never fill all of them. And when I mentioned earlier, the next fill that we're getting so the next set of collisions that we're getting it's going to be 300 colliding bunches actually it's a bit less than that but let's say roughly 300 and that means that there are let's say 300 or so places where we can inject bunches of protons and when i say bunches of protons i literally mean like 100 billion protons very close to each other and they circulate around the lhc and when they collide we might see under these conditions, something like 35 interactions on average. And that's where, you know, where things get complicated, right? Because you can imagine that these collisions happen as often as 25 nanoseconds apart. So our detector has to be able to take a snapshot every 25 nanoseconds. And then we very, very quickly in the, I don't know, on the order of microseconds, we have to decide if we want to keep or retain the information or not. And that's the trigger system. It's really a way to filter events that we consider interesting. And generally speaking, events where particles just scatter uh, not very strongly, right? They, they just sort of scatter just a little bit. We don't really collect those. Uh, other, another way to see it is that we have, you know, protons are just bags of, um, you know, quarks and gluons. And if we see a muon come out, then there must have been a violent interaction, something very interesting happening. So if we see muons, we try to collect that uh, those events, for example. And that's roughly what the trigger system will do. It has to reduce the uh, data um, throughput by several orders of magnitude so we can actually record it. OK, so Sonia is back. Live. <laughs> Live. <laughs> cool. So maybe we can ask for more questions if there's time. I want to just add the comment. You said that, that usually the magnetic field inside uh, is not acting on people. Yes, of course. Sometimes, yes, I entered many times. <laughs> 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 However, is a, is a little bit more than a, a magnetic resonance. Yeah, so I think for Sonia, it affects her mood and she gets really excited. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> uh, what does quench in sector 23 mean? Uh, can you ask again? Sorry. I'm on the, the status page and it says quench in sector 23. No beam expected before 2000. Yeah. So yeah, no beam before 8 p.m. is the first thing. It's like 20 hours is 8 p.m. And sector 23, I can't remember the nomenclature, but there are several interaction points. So uh, actually, we can use this here really quick. So interaction point number one is where Atlas and then interaction point number two. So you, you're gonna see the injection chain here. You can hopefully see these, uh, these lights coming up. And then from the PS, we go into the SPS, that's the super proton synchrotron. And then um, point one again is just right here where Atlas is. And here you can see when we inject into the LHC, just next to, uh, I guess if we move clockwise, you see point two, point three, and so on until we get to point eight. And then sector Q23, I think is in between two and three. This refers, I imagine, to a quench in one of the dipoles, but I'm not 100% sure. 
Um, it's probably a quench in one of the dipoles. Now, you remember when I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term, term quench, but it's basically when a superconducting magnet loses superconductivity very temporarily, and you have to remove all the current because bad things happen if you don't. Uh, but this actually occurs relatively often. You have to actually train superconducting magnets. And every time, so you lower the temperature, you have to imagine like, you know, that mechanically the thing is contracting and it has to sort of fall into place. And when you inject a lot of current, it becomes just really stressed. So when there's a quench, you have to do it again. And usually when you inject more current, you can go to, you can inject more current and achieve higher magnetic fields. Hopefully that helps. So you said that the muons leave, um, they ionize out in the yolk, right? And that you're collecting data every 25 milliseconds. Is that like, how does that not contaminate between collisions? Mm, so, sorry, I said 25 nanoseconds. So every 25 <laughs> nanoseconds, each of the subsystems has to be able to provide a signal. Now, some systems, are faster than others, right? So I don't know, as an example, the tracking system, when there's signals, there's like 60 million channels uh, in just in the tracking system. And when you have collisions, there's too much data. So you can't read it out too much. There's more that we haven't talked about the upgrade and high luminosity of LHC, that's a different topic. But for now, the tracking system doesn't contribute to the to the trigger system because there's too much information. But you have systems like the RPCs. I mentioned the resistive plate chambers. These are the red cables that Sonia was pointing out. Um, so those systems react very quickly and we can use those. There's also the electromagnetic calorimeter and, and the different calorimeters we use for, for triggering. Um, but, and, and then I don't know if part of the question is about how they ionize. So the, all the muon systems, we have four muon systems at the moment at CMS, RPC, CSCs, DTs, and uh, GEMS. Uh, I can, okay, I can describe them if you're very curious, but um, so each of them works slightly differently, but RPCs, for example, is something you, we can use for triggering. All of them are gaseous chambers. So that means that there's a specific gas mixture inside of the chambers. And when a charged particle like a muon goes through, it strips the electrons from, those, from, the, from the gas in that volume. And then we can collect those charges, charges in different ways to get a signal. Thank you. How do you inject proton? How do you eject protons? Inject protons. In inject protons. Inject a bunch. Yeah. yeah. So that process is slightly complicated, but it's it's basically what we were just looking at over here. So there's first um, we have a hydrogen bottle, and inside the hydrogen bottle is plenty of protons, enough to run the LHC forever. Mm -hmm. And we can strip those protons. There's a thing called a dual plasmatron. Uh, but anyway. The, after you get a stream of protons, you can uh, accelerate them first through the LINAC. We actually just uh, upgraded from LINAC 2 to LINAC 4 now in run 3. And after the LINAC, yeah, we can maybe press the button to show you guys. You don't really see the very first stages, but there's a LINAC and then there's the PS, there's the booster, and there's a few systems that you don't really quite see here. I think this is supposed to represent the PS and then through to the SPS. And each stage increases the energy of the particles. But there's many more complicated ways uh, or many complicated things, right? When the way you make the bunches, you, you organize the bunches, that is pretty complicated. But hopefully this gives you an idea of how exactly this happens. So we do it in stages. And once we have circulating protons in the protons, uh, in the PS, in the proton synchrotron, then once the SPS is ready, we inject them and then we gradually increase the energy in the SPS up to 450 GeV per beam. And then we inject those in the LHC once the LHC is ready and then gradually ramp the, uh, the current in the dipoles, the 12, 1,232 magnets. And then we gradually, that increases the energy to 13.6 TeV. Where's the return path? The return path is, uh, we call it the beam dump. So I guess that's what you're asking, uh, is how do, we get, yeah. how do we get rid of the protons? And so there's no, there's no practical way. There's only one 
proton decelerator. There's only one system at CERN that decelerates protons, and that's the antimatter factory. And Sonia has uh, is kind of pointing towards it. Uh, but okay, uh, if we run this again, so there's actually, so yeah, that's that's the antimatter factory. If you come to CERN, it has a very cool sign in front that says antimatter factory. So this this uh, houses experiments such as the Alpha experiment, which is fascinating. You should look into if you're interested. Um, but it has not really anything to do with the LHC. At the LHC, once you have, uh, let's say, a full machine, you have a maybe. I mentioned we're about to get 300 colliding bunches. A full machine means something like 2,800 bunches. And they're all traveling at this, all these protons traveling at the speed of light. Each bunch has like 10 to the 11, 100 billion protons or so. So you combine that energy of all those protons and it's like a high speed train. And you basically have to very carefully time what if there's an unplanned uh, beam dump or if you actually want to get rid of the beam in either of those situations, you have to activate kicker magnets. And those kicker magnets take a bit of time to activate. So there is, uh, I mentioned there's 3,564 possible places where you can put protons in the machine, but uh, something like 200, I don't remember how many of those BX, uh, bunch crossings are empty. Something like 200 of them are always empty. And we call this the abort gap because that's the amount of time required to activate the kicker magnets and safely uh, get rid of the proton beam. The beam gets dumped into concrete and graphite at 0.6, which is down the road from here that way. Uh, and yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Uh, so, so, so uh, yes. worry about the complete path, the flow path of the current, because you have positive charges going out. Okay. Somehow you either get back or you get a charged system. So how do you do, you do that? That is so, what I'm thinking of. Well, inside Am of, I think you're wrong. Well, two things. I, you might be. I'm, I'm not sure exactly if I interpreted the question correctly. But in the LHC, we have two separate beam pipes, and the protons travel inside of a vacuum. So all of these are positive charges. So you have, yes, net positive current inside of each of the beam pipes. Uh, now, this has many effects. And this is why when you have the beams in there, you have to carefully so uh, you have quadrupole magnets that will focus the beam. You have the different, diff many, many different ways to monitor and uh, maintain the beam, right? Uh, so it's very complicated, but you inject all these protons. And by the way, when you're colliding them, a, a lot of protons just scatter. So they exit the beam, it, they exit the beam pipe as you're colliding, they just scatter and hit different parts of the detector. Um, so what we call the luminosity or the rate of collisions gradually decreases over time because you're losing protons. But when you dump the beam, you just get rid of those positive charges. There, there are many effects that you can think of, right? So we were just almost done with a period of scrubbing where you run a lot of protons and you actually try to strip electrons that from the walls of the beam pipe, right? It's still in a vacuum, but there's of course electrons in the walls and you try to strip them because when a, an electron gets stripped from the wall, it encounters a vacuum and it can bounce around and it sees this positive current from the beam and it causes, it, it liberates other electrons from the wall and generates an electron cloud and this will cause problems, for example. So you wanna do things like scrubbing. So generally things are a bit complicated. Hopefully this is understandable, I, I hope. I wanted just to, to, to to add that, okay, the mechanism uh, uh, Andres is describing uh, and the fact that we are using uh, accelerators, so we talk about also the decelerator, the, 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 the concept uh, is the same. And uh, as you see, we are uh, doing physics uh, increasing energy, but we are also doing physics uh, decreasing energy because uh, to form anti-hydrogen, uh, we need uh, to decrease, uh, to lower the energy of the anti-protons to let them bounding uh, to, with the, the positrons. And this is uh, uh, done with the mechanism, which is a decelerator, which is nothing else, uh, an accelerator, which works uh, in a different way to decelerate, to get, take out uh, energy. 
this is not the only action uh, you are doing to, to cool down, as we say technically, the, the beam. You do also, you use also other techniques, but they say basically you cannot distinguish an from outside an accelerator from a decelerator. So they have the same elements as uh, Andres was saying. And uh, just to add uh, uh, this kind of work you are doing on the beam to prepare the beam to the, the bunch crossing, which is not exactly the collision, uh, is made that I was showing you the dipoles to bend the beam and then the quadruples to focus the beam. But then there are uh, LHC is made of uh, almost 9,000 elements. So you have also the, the sextuples, the octuples, and the decuples, all electromagnets. And they are there to really, if I can use this word, to do the makeup of the, of the, the, of the beam before the bunch crossing. Considering that the bunch crossing, crossing doesn't mean the number of collisions. For each bunch crossing, each bunch has a more or less 10 to the 11 protons inside. You get, okay, now maybe a little bit more, I don't know, but okay, in average, in the round two, we got 50 collisions for each bunch crossing, in average. Okay, CMS has a record. 78, if I'm not wrong, it's a record. <laughs> But however, uh, I don't want now to, <laughs> to advertise the CMS, but this is the truth. But uh, however, you see the inefficiency of this process is also related to the number Andres was talking before, the 25 nanoseconds. The bunch crossing happens every 25 nanoseconds just because uh, as for each bunch crossing, you get only 50 collisions. You want to increase your statistics. So you just do many bunch crossing, how many? every 25 nanoseconds, which means uh, to me, it talks much better to say that in one second, because this is something I can measure in my daily life for one second. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, uh, 40 millions of bunch crossing in one second. So you, you look at point uh, CMS and you know that uh, just in the time uh, range of one second, there are 40 million so of bunch crossing happening there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're getting close to wrapping up, but I think if we have maybe one or two more questions, that will be okay. What is the lifespan of like, do any of the sensors uh, decay or, or suffer damage in collecting all of that energy? Absolutely. So that question is also complicated and, and we can talk about it for 30 minutes, but um, let me just very quickly mention. So we mentioned the tracking detector in particular. At CMS, tracking is actually, uh, there's two separate subsystems. So I'll, very, I'll try to like right here in the center, I'm trying not to touch the electromagnetic calorimeter. So that's the tracking detector. Uh, but then within the tracking detector, you don't really even see it, but we have uh, the pixel detector. And when I mentioned we have several colleagues and my PhD advisor in the control room, those are people, those are colleagues that work with the pixel subsystem. Now the pixel subsystem, it's already in its second generation, let's say, and in a few years, we're going to replace it again. And yes, so since it's closest to the interaction point, it has, uh, it, it suffers from radiation damage and its performance decreases or, or reduces over time. There, for example, we have to cool it down to something like minus 20 centigrade just to delay that uh, radiation damage, but of course it's still there. Different parts of the, de the detector, especially the end caps of the detector deteriorate quite a bit. So there are many programs to upgrade the detector as we go along. A lot of these programs have different lifetimes or, or you know, some of these programs are, gonna, are things that are gonna be installed in five years or something like that. But uh, I think the main point that we haven't mentioned yet, so we're preparing, uh, there's a lot of work, a lot of work going on to prepare for the high luminosity LHC. So we're now starting run three, and you might imagine everyone's excited about the physics and just working, focusing on that. Well, some people are, but other people are preparing for, you know, we're gonna have something like three years of collisions, something like that. And then we have another pause, another couple of years where we spend a lot of work rebuilding many parts of the detector and preparing for the high luminosity LHC, which in a nutshell, we're trying to increase that number. When we have the protons squeezed to the width of a human hair and we get something like 
30 to 50 interactions. We want that to go up by some, well, to 150 or something like that. And a lot of the current parts of the detector that are installed right now would not survive that. So we have to replace lots of part, many parts of the detector just in preparation for that. If quickly I can ask, uh, can I add is just that okay, this is uh, really the research uh, approach that you you what we have now it's uh, a technology which is already let's say under quotation obsolete because we are always thinking how to improve what we have now. So we collect information using the, te the, the, the technology we have now, but we are already developing the one we should come. Sometimes the time scale, as Andres said, they are five years, so sometimes it's longer. And uh, consider that there are, we are already thinking what, which kind of accelerator we could uh, develop and, and uh, build after the LHC. Uh, so the time scale in, in, in particle physics can be even 30 or 40 years. This is, it depends uh, which part we are doing, but uh, this is our way, our approach. However, we enjoy results uh, nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any last question before we close? Yeah, I have one, one last one. Did we have the calorimeters and you have the calorimeters in there and they're measuring the energy of most of the particles. How do you figure out the energy of a muon, which, which is it just done off of velocity in some format? So for muons, um, yeah, I don't know. I think Sultan is one of our muon experts. Maybe I can let him comment actually. I'm sorry, I have to, to, to turn on my microphone. We measured momentum. Momentum is uh, is analogous to the to the energy. So from that you can you can calculate the energy. That's what we okay, do. So just... we do not absorb the muons. We cannot. Indeed, yeah. uh, as uh, as uh, Sonia and Andres has already mentioned, the CMS is 100 meters below the surface. It is actually below uh, not not below the shaft, but rather below the rocks. And we can still see cosmic muons penetrating through the 100 meters of rocks. So actually, uh, uh, stopping the muon and measure its energy uh, that way, as we measure for the other particles, is uh, practically impossible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So maybe this would be a good time to wrap up. Uh, I think if yeah, I, I think that works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Bye. Thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you.